In this video, we are going to review neutralization and titration problems. I'm going to split that up into two parts and do the actual problem part in part two. So we'll focus on neutralization and the process of titration to start with here. Um, so a little bit of review back to neutralization. Neutralization reactions are just the name for acid-base reactions. The product of an acid-base reaction is always a salt and water, for example. This is hydrobromic acid and potassium hydroxide. And when we react those, the H from the acid will go with the OH from the base to form water. And what's left is the K and the BR forms the KBR, which is a salt. So always a salt and water. Now, let's fold some pH in here. If it is truly a neutralization, then it has to be a strong acid reacting with a strong base. And so, if we have a strong acid reacting with a strong base, what will the pH be? So take a moment here, pause, think about that, and decide what the pH of a neutralization of a strong acid and a strong base will be. Okay? And then the next thing to think about is, what if it's a strong weak combination, like say, for example, a strong acid reacting with a weak base? Okay, if it's a strong acid with a weak base, what will the pH be when the, we have had a neutralization? So again, pause and think about that. All right, so let's look at, um, to kind of get an answer to this, let's look at the one that we didn't do, which is a strong base with a weak acid. A strong base with a weak acid, we can think of this simply, and you know, not completely correctly, but it works, to think of strong overpowering the weak. So a strong base with a weak acid will end up with the base winning out, and bases have high pHs above 7, so we'd expect a pH greater than 7. So turning that around then, a strong acid with a weak base would give us a pH less than 7. A strong acid and a strong base would give us a pH of 7. All right. Now let's look at titration, which is just a chemical or a, a laboratory process that uses neutralization. So in a titration, we're going to need some equipment. We need this thing called a burette, which is just a device for very carefully measuring an amount of liquid and a way of delivering it, and then we're going to need a flask. All right, so we start with two solutions, one of which we know nothing about or we don't know much about, and the other one is a standard solution, which just means we know a lot about it. All right, so this is uh, actual pictures of people doing a titration. So this is the burette that's sitting here. Here is a flask. This is called the uh, stopcock of the, of the burette. We'll talk about that more in a minute. So this is designed to slowly re to drip titrant out of the burette into the flask. When the reaction is finished, we say we've reached the equivalence point. All right, let's go into some of the nitty gritty here. Um, we're going to need a way to know when we're at the equivalence point, so we're going to use an indicator. We have to be careful to use the right kind of indicator. So like, for example, if the pH will be 7 when we're done, we'll need one kind of indicator. If it's 10, maybe we need a different indicator. All right, we could also use the pH meter, which is a simple thing to use, and directly read the pH. But indicators have to be chosen very carefully. All right, so if we're going to get started, here's a burette, and we're going to fill the burette up, and then here is the top of the liquid. Notice the top of the liquid is curved. It's called the meniscus. And they put a card behind it to make it a little easier to see because that gives you some more contrast. So we'll fill the burette with titrant and then measure what the volume is by reading this. It's a little hard to see, but it's somewhere uh, the 10 line is right here across here. So it's a little more than 10 milliliters. And then we're going to put in the flask the stuff that we're going to titrate with some water. We put some water so that we can see what's going on. And then we'll put an indicator in. The indicator they're putting on is called phenolphthalein. And then the titration is actually to use the stopcock to drip the liquid in slowly, looking for a color change inside the flask. So you can either get a steady stream or just a small drop at a time out of the burette by using this valve. Uh, it's kind of tricky, but it's not that bad. All right, then, when you're close to the end point, to the uh, end of the titration, in phenolphthalein, it's a very, very pale pink color that you keep. The colors will change during this, and they'll fade, and they'll, they'll deepen, but you want it to stay. If you go too far, you get this purplish, reddish color, and that's called over-titrated, and you have to back-titrate to get what you want, which is you add some acid back in there to make it go back to pink. And then when you're done, you go back and you read the uh, 
burette to know how much you've used. So if we were a little over 10, we we're a little over 35 here. So we've used 25 and some uh, milliliters of titrant. Now, one way to do this that doesn't require an indicator is using a pH meter. This is an old style pH meter. Uh, more modern pH meters wouldn't have this big analog display. But the thing about these is they're very delicate. This pH probe is made of glass and it has a glass tip on it. Also, the uh, burette is all made of glass and has a glass tip on it. And you can barely see down here, this little thing is called a magnetic stirrer. This platform has a magnet in it that causes this little bar to spin around in there. So you've got to be able to put the pH meter in there, the burette, have a hand in there, and stir this all at the same time without breaking your pH meter. Not very easy. Now, the other tricky thing about titration is this, that the curve of titration it starts out very slowly and doesn't do much and then all of a sudden it shoots up and then levels out again. This shooting up looks like it's vertical but it can't be vertical. It has just a little bit of slope to it. And this particular graphic shows that there are two different kinds of indicators we might use because methyl orange falls within this very steep portion and phenyl phenylphthalein also does. So you just carefully choose a indicator that falls within this very steep portion. But this also makes it very difficult because not very much titrate causes a huge change. All right, that's the end of part one. We will go on now and do a titration problem in part two.